Turns out I had a better one. This one is mosses, so it's a follow-up to the last chapter, uh, where if you start with the spores, you get male and female gametophytes. These are all packed in really close together. And uh, so water settles and sperm can move from the male part to the female part. Those two terms will show up on some of these overheads because they're used in, in other plants as well. And then uh, you get the zygote, which is in sexual reproduction, the first cell of the next generation. And then a sporophyte develops, it grows in the top, there it is, and it generates the spores. Now we're moving into the plants that have tubes. Uh, now the first ones don't have tubes everywhere, but they've got enough tubes to, uh, to get by. When rain soaks into the ground or it sets on a surface, it is pretty close to absolutely pure water. Even soaking into the ground, it doesn't pick up a lot of materials. Living cells are not pure water. They, I forget what percentage it is, but there, there's a lot of other stuff in cells that isn't water. In a situation where the water can move, like it can from groundwater into the plant, then diffusion, also called osmosis because it's movement of water, it's technically a movement from a high concentration area to a low concentration area. But basically, okay, here's the plant, here's the water. There's water mixed with stuff here and pure water on this side. Now, if the water can go in both directions, there's more going this way from the pure water side than is coming out from the partial water side. And that is diffusion. It moves water into the plant and then moves water up the plant. As it dilutes the bottom of the plant, now the concentration is still higher than up above, so it moves up. Keep in mind, up at the where the green parts are, photosynthesis is happening, and that's using the water, or water's evaporating into the air. Both of those are reducing the amount of water up here compared to the amount of water moving in. Root pressure, the movement of the water in can actually push water up a plant, but the water has weight. So there's a, a counter force that is gravity. And Root pressure doesn't, in and of itself, can't get the water too far off of the ground. Maybe that much. And then the weight of the water is too much. It, it pushes uh, or pulls against the movement of the water from a high concentration to a low concentration area. So there's real limits to that. Water as a molecule has a couple of properties that makes it a little weird. Because it has slightly different charges on each end, water molecules stick to each other. And they also stick to a lot of other materials that have some charges on them. It makes it really good for dissolving stuff in water. And um, it's why you can overfill a glass and you get that dome of water uh, because the water's actually hanging onto each other and it makes it harder for the water to go over the side. In a tube system, you get water way up in a plant using the water. And losing the water.
Whenever water just evaporates out of a plant, that is transpiration. It's not really what the plant wants. It wants to use the water for photosynthesis, but it is a significant way that water gets into the air. Not just off of the surface, but up through the plants and out. That means that there is essentially a suction at the top of tubes that can pull water up the plant, provided the water has a couple of features. You suck water up a straw. Once you get the water going, it hangs onto the water beneath it, and that's really what draws the column up. In plant tubes, I'm gonna give you the name in a second, the water also sticks slightly to the edges of the tube, which kind of helps it climb the tubes. Now this vascular system has tubes going both directions. The top of the plant needs water and minerals that are dissolved in groundwater, still makes the water almost pure water, to go up the plant to where they get used for photosynthesis, integrated into proteins, all the stuff that the minerals do, and the nitrates to go up, and the phosphates to go up. But it's still pretty watery um, dilution. Now, the parts of the plant that are down under the ground are not photosynthesizing. And so they need to be given their fuel. They need to be given their glucose. So glucose is dissolved into a watery mix and sent down tubes, down to the roots. So there's a set of tubes that go up and a set of tubes that go down. When you look at these in the lab, you'll notice these are really easy to recognize. They have very thick uh, edges to them. And the same way that, that an old um, paper straw, if it starts to get too soaked with, with water, you suck on it and it sucks the tu edge of the tube in. You need tubes that have some fairly good reinforcement so that the suction doesn't pull the tube shut. And that's the xylem. Phloem, when you look at it under a microscope, doesn't even look like tubes. It just looks like cells. The only way you know is because it's continuous from one section to another. And that's the thing, you're throwing this sugar water and it's just going by gravity. You don't need to have reinforced tubes in order for that to be true. Now, because I have a terrible memory, I'll tell you how I learned this and remembered it. Xylem to the high parts, phloem to the low parts. And every plant that we're gonna deal with from here on, all of the groups have xylem and phloem doing this. Now these are the tracheophytes, but I'm just gonna call them the ferns. There are some plants in this group, the tracheophytes that are not ferns, but I don't think for our purposes it really matters that much. Okay, you can write this down in your notes. I think I'm gonna leave this up here. When you think of a fern, you think of this big feathery leaf. And it really is a leaf. It has tubes in it, so it is a true leaf. It is held up by a stem. That is a true stem. It is held up on the ground by these little tendrils. Those do not have tubes in them. They're just a, a base of cells that the water can move into and get into the tubes and go up. but. There's no tubes in there, so they're, they're called rhizoids. R-H-I-Z is from a Latin word for roots. It shows up in a bunch of that stuff that has connections to roots. But these are not true roots. So ferns have true leaves and true stems, but don't have true roots. Um, a lot of times, there's a lot of feathery leaved plants that are not ferns, that are not in the tracheophytes, not in this group. One of the ways that you can kind of check to see which one you're dealing with is if you turn the leaf over, 
ferns have these little dots underneath the leaves uh, that produce the, the spores. One's called the sorus, multiple ones are called sori. It isn't a hundred percent because some, some of them are very green against a green background and are not really that visible. Um, but a lot of times if you take a feathery leaf and you turn it over and it looks very smooth and green, it doesn't look like there's anything under there, it's probably not a trachea bite. It happens to be a, a, a more advanced plant that happens to have feathery leaves. So these guys make spores. The spores go flying through the air. Again, it's a way to spread. Uh, because they, um, they have pores that are always open, they lose a lot of water, these guys do. So they only really grow someplace where there's a decent amount of moisture and they do better where the air is very humid as well. Less water lo lost to humid air. Now this one is, this is a little misleading. These spores grow into these heart-shaped structures. This would have been down here. These are tiny, tiny little plants. The gametophytes, these are the ones that do the sexual reproduction. They produce sperm cells, they produce egg cells, and from an embryo, they grow into a new fern. So it's kind of, again, similar process to what you saw in the mosses, except their distribution system is a lot more effective. With the tube system, they can get their spores released much higher off into the air, and so they've been more efficient at spreading. And for uh, a period of time in the distant past before the later groups had evolved, is that um, they did pretty well for themselves. They got, the, the, there were some giant, giant, uh, what they call tree ferns uh, that eventually got kind of outcompeted by the, uh, the later, more modern plants. Now that is it for that particular chapter.